until it's the start of the term. I've still got the cobwebs on. Thank you. Um, week one, let's get going. Rehash week two, looking briefly at student representations. And there's a little bit of an explanation there on the right hand side. It's about constructivism. Constructivism works with student representations. There are restricted representations. They're not wrong representations, but they're restricted. Basil Bernstein does a lot of work on this, an emeritus professor at the University of London, brilliant man. He talked about restricted codes and the teacher's responsibility is to elaborate those codes. Vygotsky called this the ZPD. That's the trench where all of our face-to-face -face teaching takes place. Moving on, thank you. The weekly Zoom format. Please, it's based on the contributory model of e-learning. What you put in, basically, is what you get out. I can offer you the resources to get started, but you need to go up your professional learning continuum, and we also need to go along the shared co-constructive continuum so that we arrive at a community of practice in which we are a part and in which we participate. This can be done through forums, through sharing in sessions like this, through peer-to-peer -peer groups, and if you're part of a local study group, there's nothing wrong with doing it face-to-face. -face. That's a great way of doing it. It's always worked. This is how I'm gonna chase the, the, the Zoom format each week. Pick up what's in the Q and A's. Briefly go through the weekly tasks. I won't go through all of them because some of them are quite straightforward. Talk about the links to assessment, particularly because assessment's due at, in, at the end of week uh, uh, six, sorry, week five, um, the non-teaching week. So we get there pretty quickly. And also try to point to some resources and example that you can actually use that are gonna be of relevance to you for that assessment. Okay, not to send you looking for it on a wild goose chase. So from the Q&A this week, and I thank you for that reminder to record. Um, we can talk about the fact that science education is critical to developing citizenship, and, and we're talking about thinking citizenship. It's a meta-narrative for working out how the world operates. We don't always like the results, but at least we have an understanding, and with that understanding, we can then become scientists within that framework. Very PRJ in, in its approach, very PRJ in its design, um, but it goes broader than that cognitive model that PRJ actually employed. And we'll talk about STEM later in this term and the application of artifacts like robots, um, like drones, and how these can be actually utilized for the student to increase their engagement with the world and their understanding. So it's not just about the cognitive processes PRJ identified, it's much, much more than that. So week one, we look at theoretical frameworks. And I'm not gonna waste a lot of your time by going through the old sciences. Um, we used to teach science as a fact. Now, about, uh, you know, above 50% of schools still adopt this approach, unfortunately, particularly in the senior years. Uh, the ACS is all about inquiry-based teaching. You know, around about 40% of teachers and students are, and, and schools have made that shift. There's still a long way to go. But you will graduate under the ACS and you will be asked at your interviews to demonstrate inquiry-based principles. So part of this week's lecture is going to be actually talk about what inquiry-based learning is. And there are three fundamental steps to it. It can take many forms, but there are three fundamental steps. Has anybody actually managed yet to watch the, um, the content video that I put up this morning? I did. Lauren, and you would have come across um, Professor Goodman, Dennis Goodman? Yes. Okay. I found it actually very interesting. Yeah, he does a, a really good elaboration. So my aim is not to repeat what he says here, but just to refer people back to that. You know, because that's a really good little um, vignette there, the three steps of inquiry-based learning. Um, and the, the resources I point you to there, the Science by Doing resources, are just fabulous. So please register. And that's the, the third dot point there. Please register with Science by Doing. Now, it's, it's going to be useful for every student but students who live in remote areas where the download speed is poor or the download capacity is poor, um, you, know, you may, when you come into town, want to, to download some of those science by doing resources. I'll point them to you at the beginning of next week um, because one of them is actually an interactive classroom where you can teach a whole group of avatars questioning skills um, and you can actually refine your own skills um, and you can record yourself on a webcam doing that. Um, and you can actually critique your own, own, own performance and actually work out where you, what you're doing well and what you could improve on. They have about 205 megabytes of download. So if you're in a remote area, I'll give you plenty of notice when you come into town, come in, bring your laptop and download them in here where the, the download capacity is easier at, at CQU headquarters or in any CQU campus you go to. By Just week, fine. sorry, far away. Um, I did go into that science uh, by doing website. Yep. Um, in your email, you have recommended that we 
uh, register as a teacher. Yep. What would be put in as a school organisation address? Uh, put in CQU. Put in CQU? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. And look, this little site here is actually a live video showing you how to do it. This little link here. I won't play it here because most of you are quite capable of linking onto the, uh, yeah, or watching on the video. Um, it also is on, on site, on the Science by Doing site. Yeah. But good question. Put in CQU and you'll get much more um, exposure to the resources if you register as a teacher. As a teacher and not a pre-service teacher? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, I just didn't know whether to put where I'm actually working at the moment or... So I left it blank and it's come back and it says that uh, the field is required. Yep, yep. And, and the main thing is your, your email handle. Um, it's edu.au, so you will get, um, it, it recognises your, your education relationship based on that. Well, I didn't use that email um, because I thought if I used the uni email, then after we finished university, don't we lose that after a period of time? Yes, you would. You would, but you can then re-register. Um, but, you know, it, it's the only thing issue is if you use edu.au, you get direct access to Science by Doing. If you're using your own private email address, it takes a little bit longer for them to approve it. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it, it, the choice is yours. Either will work. Okay, no problem. Yeah. And by week three, can I also ask, it may involve someone saving some of their pocket money, um, but by week three, can you please also download um, Chemical Maze? Now, this is going to be particularly useful because a lot of us feel confronted when we talk about chemistry um, as, a, as, a, as a science. Um, Chemical Maze makes that so much more simple because um, it's a wonderful app. Um, it, it's designed as a shopping app, but really it's much more than that. It's an inquiry app. You can pick any product off your shelf or out of your, your uh, partner's um, aftershave basket. You can have a look at the chemicals. You can enter them into the chemical maze and it gives you a complete breakdown on the chemical, its toxicity, what happens to it in your body, uh, what toxicities it creates in your body and what happens to it on breakdown. So it gives us a really, really good uh, evidence collection platform for, for inquiry-based science. The Moodle site, I've also set up a little video here um, giving you some navigation about how the Moodle site works. Each Moodle site is different, each lecturer is different. Um, I try to keep mine simple. Um, I've got the introduction information there, the learning management is outlined, and down here I've got the links on, on you know, in this live video, it'll take you through it. I've got the content lecture links and the Zoom session links, and each of the weeks are broken down. I encourage you, if you haven't had a look at that little video, it only takes five minutes to play and it probably will answer, hopefully, a lot of your questions about navigating that particular site. Again, I do apologise. This site was ready three weeks ago, had been quality checked, um, but apparently something happened when it went live. So we, we are catching up with that. The weekly learning tasks, moving on to part two of the, the Zoom session. Now, I do realise I'm leading a lot of this and what I want you to do is just jump in. When, when, you know, when you get to something that's got some bite. The, the reading set for this week, anyone who's done um, Earth, Biological and Space Sciences, you will have done the readings from the book chapters, um, both Loxley and, and, and um, Gregson. So you'll only need to skim read some of the chapters. So where possible, I'm going to do this kind of thing and throw in little hyperlinks um, to additional resources that may help you. So what we're trying to do is list, describe and explain. That's, if we can do that at the end of every week, you know, list, where students locate science, describe scientific understandings and explain some of the different pedagogical approaches. Well, yes, we can, we'll be able to do all of that. We can probably do that now. The key terms are, are quite straightforward. The contextualizing, again, is inquiry based. Okay, we are taking students' representations, putting them within a context and using our teaching skills to explore them. That becomes the pedagogy and the pedagogy is inquiry based. The five E's approach, I don't want you to confuse it with inquiry-based teaching. It's only one of several models of inquiry-based teaching. I also like problem-based learning. It's excellent. The POE model is a wonderful uh, inquiry-based model. Um, there are so many different approaches to doing inquiry-based learning. The five E's is just a broad umbrella approach. And I'm going to use it here because the Science by Doing resources um, really, really talk you through how to develop your, your science teaching using that model. And they're very, very good, but it could be transferred to any inquiry model. Misconceptions is the interesting assessment task one focus. Now, when we talk about representations, we all have a view, a view of the world. What I'd like you to visualize at the moment is a thermos flask. 
any sort of thermos flask. You know, normally you put your coffee in it or your cup of tea when you go camping. Now, I want you to imagine it filled with air. Now, once you've done that imagination, you've got that concept in your mind, imagine how you would draw a thermos flask filled with air. Just think about it. All right, once you've got that picture, here's your image, here's your picture, a sketch of a thermos flask filled with air. Now, I want you to empty half of the air out of that thermos flask. Sketch it again. Who would like to describe their sketch? Mine were both, both the same because I, I don't know, I didn't draw air. <laughs> you can't draw air in it. I don't know. Mine were both the same. Fabulous. Anyone vary on that? Mine was the same. So, Susan, can we go with you? Oh, uh, yeah, I like kind of, like at first I drew it and then I kind of drew it, but sort of like half of it. And then I put dots and I put dots as the air. And then when I filled it halfway, I just took half the dots away and half filled it. Brilliant. And Lauren? Lauren. Mine, mine was the same as the first. Right, right. It's interesting. So we've got two, two different operational representations there just in that small exercise. Now, again, there's no right and wrong, but clearly when, when we have a thermos flask full of air, it is full of air. Um, and if we empty half of the air out, it's still full of air. So again, yeah, the representational issue there just goes to explore how you can work with that. And when I visit students in schools, for instance, I saw someone talking about bodily fluids in a biology lesson recently, and half of the year eight girls went, yuck. And yet that teacher said, quiet, 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 you know, please, this is quite normal. This, and, and it's like, you know, don't do that. I mean, I just encourage you, yuck is a fabulous response. Go straight to it as a teacher and say, why is that yuck? Bring it out there. Get that representation happening. You know, and this is the key to getting this, this sort of misconception explored. And, you know, in the Kamburi reading for assessment task one, she talks about tabula rasa, the concept of children as blank sheets needing to be filled. Now, actually, rarely do we meet in a science class a child who is a blank sheet. They are all thinking something about something. And hence, this is why assessment task number one and our misconceptions is a really, really good assessment task. It could be a lot of fun to do. Um, a little hyperlink here. It's an American link to a text chapter all about misconceptions, and it's more of a, um, a categorical analysis of what a misconception is. In other words, it breaks it down, saying there's this kind of misconception, there's that kind of misconception. You don't need to read that, as long as you get the idea that we all understand the world differently, and some of our representations can be restricted, and some can be elaborated. That's why we've got assignment task number one. We're gonna use questioning skills to actually elaborate students' learning and their concepts. Does that make sense to people? Does, does that sound like a task that you would enjoy? Where would we access that? The, uh, the actual assessment task? All right, let me see, I'll just bring... No, no, the link that you were just talking about on the previous slide. Oh, okay, basically you'll need to get it off the Zoom video itself. I can go back one if you oh, want. I see, yeah. If you want to scribble it down now, you can. Or I, what I can do is put it in an email later and send it out to you. Okay. Do you provide um, a copy of your slides? Uh, I provide um, a video, what, what I call um, a, a video stream. Um, I can provide a copy of the slides. What I do is each week I've, I've put up suggestive slides for what we're going to cover. Um, and then I do the video content where I elaborate those slides do the Zoom session where we, we build on what happened in that video content. And, and then I've got these slides, which are really just static pictures of what we're talking about. Now, I can make them available if you prefer. Would people like that? Is, I'm here to help. If that's what you like, I can put them up. It's not a problem. But really, they're just... I, but I, I do every now and then go back to what I've done in the past. Yep, not a problem. Look, I can put them there. Um, the, the, you know, the, the main thing is um, I, I do have this adversity to having a website with PowerPoint slides hanging off it. Um, I don't actually think you know, that that's, that's great models for, for learning because what we do, people tend to replicate. But again, I'm happy to put them there. I'll create a link, a repository link, and I'll store them there each week as, as I, I build them and write them. So um, I can do that and they'll be there for those who want them, but they certainly won't be compulsory for other people.
Okay, I, I do think it'd be much better to watch the videos. So in, in the activities this week, we talk about where is science? And this is, you know, we talk about, here's, this is the minefield for misconception. Um, this is where students learn about their science. And for instance, you know, kryptonite. Um, you know, I used to imagine as a child that I had my own personal kryptonite. Um, and it, it was actually um, cod liver oil, um, which my mother used to give me. Apparently it kept me healthy. I'm still alive today, so probably it was good. But, you know, um, we all have our own version of science. And we'll talk about some misconceptions later. Activity one looked at the cross-curricular links. And again, if you can, just remind yourself um, of the seven general ca uh, capabilities um, that underpin the curriculum. Because even though we have curriculum areas, um, we, we're still bound by links to literacy and numeracy. If you look at any science lesson plan, um, either in ACS or, or, or in uh, any other model, you will see that um, you know, there are always links to the generic capabilities. You're required to make them explicit in your lesson planning, particularly in a school. So please just remind yourself they're there, you need to re um, recall them and, and what they are. But you know, science links across all of these different perspectives, particularly from an inquiry model. And you know, I'm a big believer, particularly in the early years for game-based uh, science learning, um, and particular uh, art is a big part of science, putting the art back into science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, it's always been there. As a matter of fact, um, science came from the arts if we go back in history. Technology came from the art of design, but if we go back in history, engineering actually was a visual art um, and mathematics also began as an art form. So arts preceded all of this stuff and it's time for us as teachers to use that as common ground to do some really rich constructivist work. So inquiry-based learning. Now, this information is there. What I really wanna focus on here is, is this notion, this little table. There are forms of inquiry and each of those different models put different roles on the teacher and the student. Now, we've got the question, um, who leads the questioning? We've got the method, what kind of method is being employed? And that is the, the centricity of the method, who's the focus? We've got the conclusion, who is reaching the conclusion in any particular form of inquiry? And then we've got the type of inquiry. So we can do a closed inquiry model, which is led by the teacher. And as you can see, the teacher's controlling question, method and conclusion. We've got guided inquiry, where the teacher is in control of where we're going and the student is, you know, has a lot of say in how we're gonna get there and what they need to do. We can see here, there's a looser form of guided inquiry where the teacher can pose a question and the students can reason ways of getting there and also how they're gonna get there and what they're gonna do. And we call this guided inquiry. It's a more relaxed guided inquiry or more student-centered guided inquiry is the term we would use. And then we move to open inquiry where we walk in and the teacher can simply put up on a PowerPoint slide or put up on the board a particular image or question. The students can then question what that's about or unpack it. And then they take control of the questioning, the method, the conclusion. This is open inquiry. Now, each of these different inquiry-based models are gonna require the teacher to be different. They're going to require the student to act differently. And therefore, that's, you know, that's why we're gonna to refer to Dennis Goodrum and his three stages of inquiry. Now, whatever method you use, whether it's jigsawing, um, it doesn't matter what method you're going to use for inquiry-based teaching, they're all good methods, but they should cover three stages. An exploratory stage, where you set the scene. A re-describing stage, where you come in at some stage, get people to rethink the idea, bring in evidence, and bring in the concepts of fair test, all those things that science does. And ultimately, the application extend, evaluate, create the top end of Bloom's taxonomy where you're pushing them out into the, you know, the elaborate and evaluate stage of the five E's. So Dennis Goodrum, and I'm not gonna play his video here for you, um, but Lauren has seen it. And, and look, I can't recommend this science by doing stuff more highly um, because once you register with this site, you will actually find you've got access to resources for the rest of the term, particularly for assessment tasks one and two. They are just brilliant resources. And occasionally during the, uh, our learning tasks, for instance, in week one, I refer you to the helicopter task. You know, a really simple question, what makes the helicopter go up? And you can spend three fabulous lessons working with that. Okay, question two, what makes the helicopter go down? All of these different questions. And students can learn the laws of thermodynamics through this simple exercise involving a paper helicopter spun using the fingers. So it's, it's a really you know, interesting, 
I've had a look at that site, Colin. I was just wondering, is it more high school? Because I could only see like year seven, eight, nine. Is it just more high school based? It is more high school. But again, I'm focusing primarily on the... Um, the process and stuff. Yeah, the professional modules that are embedded in the okay. uh, teaching uh, component of the course. Um, those of you, for instance, who want to focus on upper primary, you'll find the year seven stuff, you know, quite good. Quite good. Quite, quite adaptable, in fact. Um, what I found interesting is I was working with grade sixes on my last prac and unintentionally I actually used this model and didn't realise until I'd seen it that I'd used this model. It just, just so happened that the lesson structured that way. Brilliant. And how did that work for you? It actually worked really well because we, uh, we looked at static electricity. Yep. So what I did was I did a mind map of what do we already know about static electricity um, you know, here are a couple of experiments or you can design your own to try it out, find some observations, have a bit of a play around with it. And then we came back at the end and discussed what we found and what we can add to our knowledge now. That's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's very intuitive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well done. And, and look, obviously, we're, we're preaching to the converted to a high degree here. So, um, yeah, you may be for instance, expected when you get out to school, you may be set this challenge by your your mentor teacher you know to actually engage in some inquiry based teaching so and it's very easy once you get into it but if you've got the discipline of the three steps behind you as we've just heard it can be quite a comfort to actually you know pick up this model so we go on to stage one i'm not going to play this video but i do recommend them to you an experienced teacher actually introducing um the an activity and using the inquiry based approach to do so video number two we actually watch the students doing the activity which is brilliant um, and you can see the level of engagement and interaction. Now, the student, uh, the teacher in this actual video, if you go on to watch it on the Science by Doing site, actually has never taught these students before. So it's his first interaction with them. And you wouldn't think it to see how well this, this lesson actually goes. Obviously, he's experienced, but he's experienced because he's experienced in his method. He knows what he's doing. And the third step, actually, is discussing the activity where he actually changes shape. He, you know, he is a shape shifter. And I like to use that metaphor. As he teaches, we see he adopts what I call three basic principles. Um, he begins as the sage on the stage. And we all, you know, one of the queries we have as a teacher is, how am I going to do this? What do I look like? How am I going to be? What identity um, will I take on? Because you do need, is a, a lot of it is acting and role play. Um, so he begins as the sage on the stage. He starts at the, the top of the classroom as, as the, the pseudo lecturer in total control. He is the conductor. And he's throwing this lesson around the room and he's feeding the pigeons. Very much a sage on the stage. By the time he moves into the second where the students are doing the activity, he's what we call the meddler in the middle. It's small group work. He's moving around. He's provoking the students. He's helping them summarise. He's reframing their questions. He's meddling in their thinking. This is heavily Vygotsky and this is heavily sociocultural constructivism. He's working with the social capital and the intellectual capital of the students in this, as the meddler in the middle. And then finally, he identifies, he's a good teacher, he identifies those students who are struggling. And he sits down with them side by side, he becomes the guide on the side. And he's sitting beside them. And this is the aim of every class you get into. Set the, set the pace, set the parameters, set the timing. Okay, and also set the expectations. Then get around and get them going, get them motivated. And the third stage is the guide on the side. Work out who's not doing it, who can't do it, who won't do it. And once you've identified those people, sit down beside them peer to peer. And he demonstrates this beautifully. And in the end, it's a very, very successful lesson on levers and the principles and rules of seesaws. So it's a really, really good example. Um, anyone like to comment on that at this particular point? I actually have a question, Colin. Susan. Um, kids always really interested and engaged when they're doing the hands-on stuff, but then when it comes to getting them to write it down or draw a diagram or, you know, like they need something in their book so that when they go back and need to, uh, you know, revise for their tests and stuff, how do you get them more in, like, I don't know, I just find it really hard to get the kids that are really interested in doing the thing in the activity to actually write it down and... yeah. Yeah, that, that's a brilliant question. And, and you, you may, those of you who've watched this particular video and this teacher, um, he issues them with a, a worksheet, which is part of a, a science notebook. 
Now, the science by doing folk, as we get familiar with their resources this year, um, their argument is every science, every scientist um, has a notebook. Um, you can't actually survive without them. So um, part of their curricular model is, is to actually get students to establish a notebook. Um, and that notebook becomes their basis, you know, that their identity within that classroom. Um, and so for this particular task, because it was a one-off, he came in with a sheet and said, you know, we want you to write your, your, your processes down here. We want you to write all of your different tests. We want you to write the steps you did. And of course, so they come away with a written record of their actual investigation. So that's how he tries to deal with it. But, you know, Susan, you've hit on a perennial problem. And part of our goal um, this term is to actually provide some, uh, a range of answers to that question. But the science by doing people do point to notebooks um, slash worksheets as, you know, okay, they're old technologies. Some people are using blogs, classroom blogs, where the people go and publish their findings and they have like a little research consortia in, in, in a wiki or, or a blog. Um, there are a whole range of um, options that we'll look at um, as the term goes on, but it's a really, really good question and, you know, good thinking. Actually, um, sorry, go I ahead. I find collaborative or jigsaw writing like when you you know rather than expecting young children to write like a whole paragraph themselves okay find two observations yourself then someone else finds two observations someone else has two more and you work together to create something bigger than they could have achieved yeah that's a great idea lauren like yeah that is good i like the jigsaw stuff mm. yeah. i found it works really well especially for grade six boys because they tend to not want to write the ones i was talking about <laughs> Yeah, that's brilliant. And, and we, we also have other models like the Envoy, you know, where you, you put people in groups and appoint someone to report back to the group at large. And you know, there are all kinds of, you know, jigsawing approaches that are inquiry based. That, you know, that's really good information. Thank you. So I'm not going to spend too long going through the, the phases of the, uh, the 5E. Um, we're getting plenty of feedback from group members here suggesting we're well aware that the 5Es are not the only inquiry model. But we're going to present it because it really does help you. We're going to link in at the next stage of this um, course. We're going to link in assessment and we're also going to look at reflection too and how they feed into the inquiry model. And the 5E's um, platform is a really nice model for doing that. So again, I'll refer you to the video and have a look at the, the 5E model. Um, it really does, does offer you a good useful heuristic. That's all it is, a heuristic. It's a tool for looking at these principles. In the activities, we also ask you to think about what, what the characteristics of good teaching are. And, and I offer you this slight summary. Again, it, it's very generic principles, but it's teaching for engagement, learning and understanding. And there are steps, you know, four distinct steps that we can take as teachers around that. Um, and, you know, they're listed there for you. And again, this is just to, again, help build and solidify aspects of your own practice because um, there's no point being a theoretical teacher. What we're trying to do here is build resources and approaches that you're going to be able to walk out of, uh, out of this website and out of this um, um, uh, screencast and actually apply with real kids in real time. So that's, that's our goal here. Um, the characteristics, again, um, you know, I talk here about the sage on the stage um, for the introduction. You're a facilitator. Um, never do we assume, we may have an elaborated version of the science um, that we're talking about, and the restricted um, versions in front of us are the ones that we've got to shift. But we're going to find our group you know, is, is not hom homogenous. We're going to find out there are kids who are well advanced with, with the elaborated versions of a the, of the theme. And there are kids who are so restricted that they're not even on the same page. And by moving our facilitation model, the sage on the stage, the meddler in the middle, the guide on the side, we are actually to go through this cyclical process. It's nice to think that we're all robots and the five E's are linear. That's not the reality though. The reality is the five E's are cyclical and they involve assessment, what we call formative assessment at each stage. And they also involve reflection for us to go back and look at each of these stages to ensure that each of our groups, each of our students, all of our students get these principles, most of our students get these and some of us get these. That's what we go into any lesson with, okay? A, a minimum bottom line, a nice preferred state, and then a dream scenario where everybody gets everything. Bloom has to pop up. Um, who likes Bloom? Who's, who's had experience of Bloom before? Yep, most people should have by this stage, stage two and three of your, your program. Um, we're using the, um, the amended version um, of Bloom. Um, and this, uh, I've put some links to the, uh, um, the new authors in two th around about 2000, 2015. They've been working on, on this uh, new elaborated version of Bloom and they've just basically re-jigged the create stage. 
Um, but, you know, we, we're going to look at Bloom um, and it's the focus of your first assessment task because you need to build what we call questioning techniques, a question survey um, to shift students away from a misconception in science. Now, those misconceptions can be broad. Um, you know, they, they can be quite influential. I mean, you know, um, we can have a look, for instance, in the United States, there are, of the 52 states, there are three states which teach creation science. Um, that is, you know, the world was created in seven days. Um, that is basically their, their approach to science. Um, in the United States, they're allowed to do that because of the nature of the Constitution. Um, however, in Australia, we're not. We have to teach alternate scientific frameworks. Um, so Bloom's, you know, comes in uh, and is quite useful here. But in the United States, it'd be a little bit harder to question in, in some of those um, um, Southern American states. Um, it'd be hard to use Bloom's to question the central pedagogy there, which would be quite challenging. But the aim of Bloom's is to create a questioning framework, a cognitive framework, to help us deconstruct science and uh, misconceptions through questioning. It's about, it is the crux of assessment task one. And please, your task today is to review the assessment task and criteria so that by the time we get into the Q&A next week, we hopefully we'll have some good questions around that. And the Science by Doing website have an excellent resource on effective questioning. I'll talk more about that next week, but in this one, you can actually uh, download the module and you can actually, um, it, it teaches you to trial using video cam with a, a group of avatars and there's no behavior management issues. You can actually just work your questioning techniques and you can record it on your own computer and, and re-watch how you, you um, teach a science concept. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice um, step we'll get into, um, but that's Bloom. That's why Bloom is here. Um, and it is, um, it's, again, it's, it's the, um, the 1962 version reworked in 2000, in 2000, 2001. And um, again, if there's anything about Bloom you don't understand, it's a really good chance uh, to explore and raise through the Q&A. Um, Bloom's levels of questions, a couple of examples there of how they work, um, right through to creating, it's a hierarchy, it's a cognitive hierarchy, and the aim is to build the lower levels first, and here's the value of flipping the classroom. Often we see people flipping a classroom and they put the lower level Bloom's functions. What is the knowledge, okay, and what is the application? And that's usually done, you know, usually through the resource bases, the, the internet or the textbooks or whatever it is we're giving students. And then we move down through the hierarchy or actually it's inverted, we should be moving up through the hierarchy towards the creation where the students are actually creating and applying the knowledge in new situations. Activity five gets you to have a look at Bloom's um, and creating some questionings. And, and it also spills into this whole notion of misconceptions. And a couple, you know, obvious ones that we come across, there was a really fabulous piece of research done by the meat industry four years ago, um, where they actually looked at um, five different uh, uh, raw product meats. Um, and they actually surveyed um, five and six year old children as to where the meat came from. And less than 40% of children actually understood that meat was in fact dead animals. Um, so it's a really interesting notion about misconceptions. They're out there, they do exist. And we, you know, our whole mission here is to apply scientific principles to address them. Not to beat kids around the head, but to apply scientific principles to elaborate their worldviews. Cotton comes from sheep, an interesting one. Mass and weight are the same thing. Dinosaurs and cavemen lived at the same time. I mean, how many cartoons do we see that? The Flintstones, go figure. Mixing paints is the same as colors. Things dissolve when they disappear. Plants get food through their roots. Sands cannot travel through liquids and solids. And now, of course, a lot of these things are not untrue, but only partially true. And, and I remember when I first met my wife um, back in 1981 in a high school classroom, she had a pencil box. And on her pencil box, she had written, beware of half truths. You may have the wrong truth or the wrong half. And it's the same with misconceptions. They may not be entirely wrong, Okay, but they may be partially incorrect. And if something's partially incorrect, then what we build on that, that conception or that idea or, the, or that representation will just continue to be more incorrect. Activity six, come up with some of your own uh, mis in, misconceptions. And here's a few. Um, I, I went to a couple of the movies that uh, I see my own daughters watch and, and um, shook my head in, in, in science disbelief. Um, Star Trek and Star Wars fans, um, Armageddon, space, space explosions. Is there any noise in space? I ask you that one. Um, C3PO, oh, I used to love this line. The possibility of navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,270 to one. Um, he got away with a lot of mischief, C3PO, just because he was cute. 
Um, the problem is, you know, a recent NASA probe, um, uh, the Juno probe, actually reported the chance of getting hit by space junk or an asteroid is about a million to one. So C-3PO, we've busted your myth. You're wrong. Um, you can hold your breath forever. Um, the world record is actually 22 minutes. Yeah, surprised me. You can't hold it forever, but there you go. Um, the Titanic was a good one there. I, I actually kept hoping Jack would survive, but I imagined the end. Um, we all knew the boat sunk, so I guess it's kind of two and a half, three hours wasted time. Um, ah, Star Wars. He's going to hit the laser with his sword. I love those ones. You know, go figure. How does that happen? Alien computers run Windows. Did you know that? It's fabulous. Um, if you're not moving in space, or if you're moving in space and your engines get blown up, you'll stop. Um, I doubt it. Not till you hit a planet. James Bond has his, his gene therapy changes appearance. Doesn't quite happen that way. And we often see Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, shooting people and then sending them backwards through the room with a nine millimeter bullet. Well, the science behind that actually suggests that that's not going to happen. You're more likely to stumble and drop to your knees. So children's movies, misconceptions, it's nobody's fault. It's a rich minefield for science inquiry. You know, our mission is to get excited. Um, I had an entire high school assignment once. We had to watch the movie Dante's Peak. Oh, yes. And we had to find a scientific inaccuracy as well as two pieces of the scientific equipment that we used incorrectly in the movie and had to discuss those three points and how they were inaccurate in the movie and how they would be accurately used in the real world. That's just, that's point. gold. Yeah, well done. That's gold. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments there? All right, just moving on to the final slide for this, um, this session. I've actually put up a, uh, um, a, a little example of, of two, the same lesson. Um, and we're seeing, you know, over 50% of schools still rolling out these worksheets where they're getting students to get out a microscope. The first lesson they run on microscope use, and I've seen this this year in one of, one of Townsville's apparently most advanced science schools, um, pull out the microscope. They do two workshops on how to run a microscope, how to clean it down, how to prepare it. And then they're basically put into pairs. They collect things, they examine it, and, and then they um, predict how the organism would move or they write it or they draw it in their books. And that's the end of the session. Compare that to an inquiry model over here. And we've already heard from, from some contributors to the, for, to the discussion earlier about this really important stage, the end discussion. And you can see the stages here, the brainstorming, the actual student activity, followed by the class discussion. Inquiry-based science is not rocket science. It's just inquiry science, three basic steps. Um, our goal is to actually take those three steps Adopt a pedagogy, it could be the five E's, problem-based, it could be jigsawing, um, we've heard mentioned a few times. Um, it could be the Envoy model, it could be um, POE. There's a whole range of ways of approaching inquiry-based learning. Our task this semester is to use some of those, those um, uh, techniques to dispel student misconceptions. I'm going to stop talking there and throw over to you. Any comments or feedback or questions people would like me to take away and, and work with? Or any comments people would like to make and share with each other? Okay, we've got some, some quiet there. Um, so what I'll do then is commit any further uh, questions or inquiries. Um, to either email or the Q&A. Um, I do check my email between nine and 10 every morning and between four and five every afternoon. So if you have something urgent, you've sent it during the midday, bear in mind it will take me to that final hour to get through to them um, because I am dealing with you know, close to 200 emails a day. So, um, and they're all important. And that's why I try to set up a system where I can get around them. So please do email, don't think I will ignore you. Um, post to the forum. I'm already discovering in this course there's a wealth of information out there and a wealth of experience. Um, so we're going to draw on you. This, this collaborating student module is really going to work in, in this course and I can see some rich perspectives flowing in from that already. Um, that's about all from me. Is there anything anyone would like to say before we, um, we stop and record this session? All right, on that note, I thank you all for your attendance, please. And this will be recorded and posted under the forum. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.